streaming live around the world, this is Paper Cuts with Brad and Jay. We'll just get this out of the way here. Thanks for joining us on Brad's show. Yeah, thanks for coming to my show. You I did not say shenanigans. <laughs> okay. Are you, are you drinking already? No, I've just got water. Just got water. <laughs> Always looking smooth, aren't you? Yeah, I, I do. I try to clean up for the show. Look, one of us has to. Come on. Kicking off season four. Joining us this evening, the multi-talented Keelan Patrick Burke. We are live. Holy cow, we are live. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another season of Paper Cuts. Kicking off four season years, Jay. Four, four whole four years. years. <laughs> Does that mean we've been doing this for four years? Or, no. Are, are, we, are we going by seasons, the actual seasons of the year? Sure, right? yeah. Like, like, you know, summer, spring. Summer, spring, whatever. winter, fall. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm in Ohio, so we have winter and summer. So that's basically what we have. It was 99 right. degrees the other day, and today it's 60. <laughs> yeah. And how have I not shut the show down yet? That That's weird. This is like it's because I'm for me. it's because I'm in control. I won't let you do it. Yeah. What's up, everyone? <laughs> My name's Jay. Show. Yeah, it is. It is Brad Show. What's up? <laughs> I'm Jay, and with me, 98 percent of the time, Brad's over there. There you go. I'm we've been busy since our last show. We, we, we took have. a off. We've been busy. What have we been doing? Well, you've been doing nothing. Just twiddling your thumb. You, you've been redoing the basement. You've been redoing your basement. Remodel is seventy five percent done. But we've got a website now. You have a website. If you haven't heard, now. yes. What is that website? Do you have it ready, like a little uh, uh, graphic to put up on the show there? Sure. On the Hold on just a second. Wow. Yeah. Okay. As he's doing that. So speaking of, you know, what we've there been go, doing. Jay. There we go. See, it works. We're live dot com. Yeah. We've also been, you know, landing some uh, pretty big guests for season four, right? Mm-hmm. Pretty much behind the scenes. And speaking of huge guests, I mean, we had to do some dirty deeds for for this one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe some blackmail was involved. You oh know, yeah, pictures that we may not be able to talk about. You know all that stuff. <laughs> pictures of you though, right? Yeah, I mean that's yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. Works. Yeah, it's yeah. papercutslive.onlyfans.com. Is that what it is? <laughs> After hours. <laughs> After <laughs> hours. Yeah. So you know from some of his books, you know Turtle Boy, Ken. The house on Abigail Lane, or you may know from his artwork, right? His stunning artwork gracing the covers of a lot of your favorite tons of books. Books. I know him because he's my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be weird though if you all actually live next door to each other and just yeah. didn't realize it? This I whole didn't time? know he was my neighbor. I know that now. So it's, time yeah. to <laughs> it's like we, we we cross paths and Kroger carts going this way. <laughs> yeah. Kind of Everyone. Like- Ramming carts together. Exactly. <laughs> like, hey, sir, can you, can you? I can't reach the top shelf there. Can you help me out? <laughs> Everyone, welcome to the show. Bram Stoker Award winner, Keelan Patrick Burke. Thank you so What's much. Going for on, being Keelan. Here. I appreciate it. Hey, hey, all. Thanks for having I, me. I got to ask real quick is that how you introduce yourself? Do you use all three names or, or uh, such as a writing thing? And... It depends. I mean, it depends on who's asking me. Okay. <laughs> You know, I mean, I don't walk up to people. If the mailman doesn't come and just go, are you? And I go, that's me, Keelan Patrick Burke. <laughs> well, I mean, it's almost like it's almost like that James Bond kind of Bond. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? That persona. So, it's, you know what? I'll give, you, I'll give you an exclusive for your show. I actually, Francis is another one of my names. It's Keelan Patrick Francis Burke. Okay. Literally nobody knows that. Nobody. Now, I think my now mom it's... might suspect now... it, but. <laughs> Your mom might suspect it. She might, she might have the inside track on that one. There, there's a rumor about it. it you know, she's going to have to find out about it. That is no. yeah, that's my porn name. Yeah. <laughs> so so that name didn't make the cut for all your, your uh, books or anything. Just right out of space. I'd just be beating the shit out of it if I was putting on my books. <laughs> right. I mean, that is the book. That name, if that was any longer, it'd have to have chapters. I mean, people think it's like two authors on it. The right. Four yeah. names. Yeah. Patrick and Francis Burke. You know, another one of these collaborative efforts exactly there you go yeah so you just got back to town you've been doing some traveling yeah yeah i was uh i was down in tennessee uh the, the smoky mountains mm-hmm. absolute absolutely amazing um tennessee is beautiful i've been through it a couple of times but i'd never actually stayed there so this was my first time spending about a week down there um ostensibly just to get the hell away from everyone but yeah. also because <laughs> I am researching uh, the next project, which is about, it's set down there. Okay. It's about lunatic preachers and uh, snake handlers and serial killers. 
set in the 1930s. So you've already what, what better place you've to already go got my Tennessee. attention. <laughs> yeah, what well, I want to get down there real deep into the woods and the mountains and just get a feel for it because literally where I am in the book takes place right there. So that's awesome. I want to just jump into it for about a week and come out and feel like I actually wrote a lot while I was down there, which was amazing because I had a view of the Smoky Mountains. So right. it, was, mm -hmm. it was incredible. Did you uh, talk to people around there and just say, I'm doing research? Tell me about. You know, no, I try not to do that because depending on where you are, people can either be too effervescent and go on for three hours and you got to be the asshole. <laughs> Sorry, I got it. Or they, gotta clam, go. they clam up because nobody trusts anybody anymore. Uh -huh. you know, it's like, you're writing what for who? <laughs> who are you? And I'm like, you know what? Never mind. So I'm Keelan Patrick Francis Burke, don't you? Exactly, know? <laughs> yeah. And Francis, and I report to Keelan. I forget the rest of his name. <laughs> it's yeah. too long. I couldn't remember it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I just I observed more than anything, and you know, I had some encounters with locals where we just discussed random stuff. But it's the flavor of the place that I wanted. So even just talking mm -hmm. about something that has nothing to do with the book is a great way to get the cadence of the place as well. You know. Yeah. So yeah, it was an absolute, probably one of the most successful trips I've had in that regard. Um, sorry, just looking at the comments. Um, yeah, but it's, it, it was great because I, I, as I was down there, I could just I get immersed in it. it. I couldn't wait to write. I couldn't wait to sit down and get back to it. And other than a couple of hours reserved for some sleep tonight, I'm probably going to wake up tomorrow and get back at it again because I like to tackle it while it's still fresh in my head, you know? Mm-hmm. Holly, like... I'm sorry, just comment by Holly Garcia here. Holly, that's that's not how how do you have the same painting as me? <laughs> same picture, but a different painting. I hold she's uh, she's your neighbor on the other side, but she... or is this the <laughs> trans-dimensional thing I've been hearing so much about? So you're yeah, saying it's not a real Picasso or <laughs> oh it's, yeah, it's a real one. I I spent I spent millions on that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Painted it myself, actually. So you just got back into town, so everybody, just so everybody knows, if he dozes off, it's it's not because, it's because of Brad this fall. It's not because of Brad this, this time, okay? It's because he just got back into town, literally. Like, he was yeah, beating. That's, that's the cover story, anyway. Yeah. I mean, he was beat. He sped through, He doesn't even remember Kentucky. He sped through it so quick. I mean, who would want to, right? But yeah, still. Not much here. He loves yeah. Cincinnati, though, it's on the way through. Jay. an amazing drive coming up through Kentucky. Cincinnati is in Kentucky, right? <laughs> it was gorgeous weather today. So, I mean, Kentucky was beautiful as well. Yeah, it was it's nice today outside. Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, when you were down there in Pigeon, did you do all the touristy stuff in Pigeon Forge or were you just out in the woods? No, I don't really do touristy stuff. I can't stand tourists. I don't want to be one of them. <laughs> I, I mean, every nice place I've ever been has been wrecked by other tourists. Uh huh. If you're standing on a mountaintop looking out over the woods and it's serene, you can be guaranteed that somebody else will pull up right behind you because they saw you looking at something and happened <laughs> what it was. And then they get out and it's usually they start spouting bullshit to their husband or wife or, whatever, <laughs> or talking to the camera while they're filming it without looking at it. Yeah. And I just want to grab that person and fucking just throw awesome. them off the mountain <laughs> yeah. and then go home and write about it. That's recent. <laughs> That's, that's a t-shirt. That's, that's in-depth research, right? There. That's a t-shirt. I hate tourists. Yeah. <laughs> because I've seen like on TikTok, there's like behind the scenes of TikTok videos where someone's like on the beach and they're filming the ocean. There's no one around. And then they turn around. There's like all the tourists behind them doing the exact same thing. It's all cameras. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, it looks like they're just in the middle of nowhere, but really yeah. everyone's doing the same thing next to them. Yeah. I, well, I, I do that at work sometimes. I start looking around and other people come up. What are you looking at? Just walk away, just screw with her head. So I'm looking at Laurel's comment here. Laurel, I do remember Kentucky. I've I've been there a bunch of times. I really like it. But Cade's Cove has me kind of intrigued. Mostly because I enjoy being driven to murder, though. <laughs> As research, right? Uh, yeah. So do you do you have a title for the new book? Yeah, it's called Cotton Mouth. Okay. Oh, see, I'm I'm all about this already, just from what you've said about it. The title it's, and snake handlers is, and stuff. It's another Southern Gothic. I'm I'm quite pleased with how it's turning out so far, but it's uh which will come as a surprise to no one, I suppose, but it's a particularly grim one. So I'm enjoying the hell out of it. How long have you been working on it? Oof, I've had the idea for about eight years. 
um, started writing it at the start of this year. Um, scrapped it about halfway through and started again, which mm -hmm. I do. Often. That's not a. That's not like one of these things where you hear about a movie having to do reshoots. It's just. Uh, <laughs> it's just I. I actually, in the writing of it, figured out where I really wanted it to go, and that required me to restart it. So, uh -huh. I am about midway through now. Okay. So it was a totally different direction when you start restarted it. Not a totally. You didn't use your thing. Not a totally different one. It just okay. focused on a different character, and also part of the problem was that a minor character became a major one in the in the writing. Right. Mm -hmm. I became fascinated with that character, and that character ended up being uh, supremely interesting. So that altered the direction of everything too. So it was easier just to start and see where where they would take me and that was the right way to go. So it was like an instance where the story started writing itself. And so yeah. just, okay. Very much. Okay. Yeah. I had a plan for it. I had plotted out. I sat down and about 20,000 words into it, it went and I went, Hmm, where's this going? Mm -hmm. So I followed it and that required me to restart and put more emphasis on certain characters to make it make sense later. I mean, I mean it's good. You, you saw it early enough to restart. Not at the, not at the end, you know, <laughs> yeah. Five words from the end. Oh no! Right, <laughs> like scrapped yeah. the whole thing and just yeah. Damn, wrong state. I said in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Does that happen often? Where maybe another character takes precedence over what you thought was going to be the main character, or the story All switches the and stuff like that? It didn't used to. I mean, I can remember probably the first ten books I, I wrote and even short stories, never having that problem. I don't know if it's something to do with getting older or whatever, or your instinct gets honed a little more. But it does happen all the time now. It's like I start writing and it's a fishing net. You're just casting it to see exactly what it is you'll drag up. And once you do that, you start the story properly. It's like there's a dry run first. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's worked though. It always works for me. It's, I find the story by writing it and then mm -hmm. go back and, you know, really write the story. Is this uh, one you already have a publisher for? Or are you going to do it yourself? or No, I do have a publisher for us um, and a December deadline. So I'm kind of <laughs> really up against it. Yeah. One of about five I have, but I'm not going to panic much. Till the day before. <laughs> it worked great that way, though. If I know I'm running out of time, that's when usually when I work the hardest and the best stuff comes out. I watched you on uh, when you were on with Chad and Jason Parent was I think bleeding page is what it's called. Now, I liked your when you're talking about how you decide how you want to go with a publisher or if you just want to self publish something. I like that conversation you had. Yeah. So is that something you still sort of do? Like, I want this to be out tomorrow instead of waiting for a few years for it to be out. Definitely, it's not the weight that bothers me so much as the nature of the project fits a particular direction. If um, mm -hmm. You know, if something I have written before had a publisher, I will most likely go back to them and say, well, I'm about to do this. Would you be interested in, in the follow up? Mm -hmm. If it's a huge novel I've worked on, which I finished um, recently, a novel that another one that took me seven years to write it and I finished it. That one will do the New York tour via my agent. Mm -hmm. And it's a great position to be in because if she can sell it there, fantastic. If she can't, well, then I'll put it out myself doesn't really bother me either way what what matters is that people get to read it right um and sometimes i'll write something that's too short to even bother trying to place it anywhere so i'll just put it on amazon and you know it'll be something for people to read while they're waiting for the next big release to come out mm -hmm. but I, there's so many avenues now that i think that it, you know it behooves all of us to, to explore them to get as much place uh, as much stuff out uh, via various avenues and increase our output that way. Do you feel like you see a wider range of uh, book reaching an audi an audience as uh, going traditional route versus indie route, or is it really not make a bunch of much of a difference for your work? Honestly, I I don't know anymore what the difference mm -hmm. in reach is because if you hit something the right way and you self publish it, it can be as big as a mass market release. Yeah. Conversely, you put something out through New York, they don't give it any push. Nobody picks it up. And then they, you know, good luck trying to publish another one because the sales figures weren't good enough. Mm -hmm. So it's a gamble either way. But ultimately, 
I don't know. I just think you try whatever approach works for you. If it doesn't pan out, you try something else. But you never, mm-hmm. you never give up. You gotta, you gotta keep, keep at it and try to get the book out however you can. How long do you normally allow your agent to uh, try to sell it in the New York route before you decide to go a different route? Probably about six months to a year. It depends on her workload. My agent is also Neil Gaiman's agent, so he's up here and I'm way down there. <laughs> no, I don't know about way down there. I, yeah. well, you know, way down there. Um, <laughs> but I mean, uh, after the show, you'll be level with them. Just, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the they'll fall reason. even farther down. Is what <laughs> came on here was to boost my profile. Right. But uh, it'll be um, it'll be a case where you know she'll know after reading it whether or not it has selling potential and she already Mm -hmm. does with the new one but it's just a case now of getting it to the point where it will appeal to as many audiences as possible instead of just straight one avenue you know yeah so that's what i'm doing as well as the other 90 things i'm doing is to get that to the point (laughs) where all of us are happy with it being the first thing to come out from new york assuming Mm -hmm. you know somebody wants it but yeah i i don't put uh all my apples in that cart what i'll do is i'll send it to her and then i'll immediately get started on something else and then get obsessed with that instead instead of sitting here going oh come on come on what's what, is it going to sell is it going to sell yeah i did that for enough years and it drove me insane so now i just keep writing yeah. do that. I, was, I was gonna mention that because i mean like it's someone maybe right through their first one and they're waiting of six months to a year you know they're gonna drive themselves crazy if they're not writing five other things during that time you yeah. know Write so the next that's a lot of right that's a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Write it, send it off, stop thinking about it, write the next one. Now, obviously, you can't completely disconnect from that because your hopes right. and dreams are wrapped up in it. Yeah. Write the next one because chances are the next one will be better than the first one. And then do the next mm-hmm. one, the next one, next one. Just keep and don't stop. And then when you forget about it, all of a sudden you hear from someone and it's either a yay, you got it, or no, but what else have you got? And by then you have something else. Yeah. That's good advice for new writers too. Yeah. To not yeah. Just... And the other end of that is too, sometimes like, cause I know a few other writers who, uh, you know, they've landed a deal with the publisher, yeah. but it's not going to be released for another year, you know? So now they're like, well, if I were to release it now, people would see it or yeah. I want to wait to get the push from the publisher. I can't wait for a year to when you guys get to read this and then, you know, such what? a big build up, and then it could be a letdown after a year too. So. I think one of the big challenges with traditional publishing is the weight required between when you submit it to mm-hmm. when it is sold, assuming it does get sold, to when you can announce it, to when it gets released. It's an awful lot of time. And yeah. I think that's a, a, one of the biggest reasons that people just don't bother with it anymore. They mm-hmm. think it's going to self-publish it. Right. And it's getting harder and harder to argue against that approach. Because yeah. if your book cover is good if your book is edited and copy edited proofread and it's as good a, a model as you'd find in new york right mm-hmm. why would you wait yeah especially like an outlet like amazon where you can do everything yourself yeah, yeah. It, is, it is up to you and the thing is people say oh yeah but with the power of new york behind it but you don't always get the benefit of that power right and then yeah. it falls on you to promote it anyway so if there's minimal difference between the do the, between the two other than prestige who cares yeah i've seen quite a few authors on twitter where they are with a bigger publisher and they are just every day promoting their own stuff because the publisher's not doing it for them yeah so as well I mean, obviously the publisher is not going to do it all but yeah. you expect a certain amount of power behind the book mm-hmm. and if that's not there you were better off doing it yourself anyway yeah because then there's less hands in the pot saying oh you should change this and fix that and maybe they decide the cover and it's not what you really want and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Do you ever have you ever ran into that with uh, your bigger ones where the 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 bigger publishers want to change things and any back and forth? Not to a significant degree. I mean, um I have I I, I greatly value editorial feedback and mm-hmm. I've been lucky enough two days with a couple of minor exceptions. Uh, where the suggestions made endlessly benefited the finished result. I I, yeah. I love that. I love editorial feedback. And mm-hmm. I don't get upset if somebody says, well, this character is an absolute waste of time. You're rid of it. <laughs> I'll immediately get, you know, what, what? And then I look at what they're saying and, and you know, why they said that. And 99% of the time, they've turned out to be right. The 1% of the time when I absolutely refuse to believe that they're right, and I know instinctually they're not, 
then it doesn't change. I will tell them I'm not removing that. And if you make me remove it, I'm taking the book away. So mm -hmm. because it's not worth getting published if what they end up publishing is not the book you wrote. Right. Yeah. You know, um, it's their vision, not your vision. Yes, exactly. And like I said, you know, there was one publisher wanted me to change the ending of the book in case we decided we wanted to do seek. We wanted to do. <laughs> and I said, I didn't write this book with for a sequel. sequel. And it's not scream for, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it is its own thing. And if there's a demand for a sequel and you want to do it and we mutually agree to do it, mm -hmm. then I can do it in a way that didn't require short changing the first book. Yeah. You know, right. Thank you. I, I think like, Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I was, gonna, I was just gonna say, I think that's one of the selling points for uh, people to do it themselves. You know, they, they don't want someone else's vision out there for that. They want theirs out there. So the flip yeah. side of that though, is that a lot of people could benefit right. from, from editorial feedback because there are, yeah. there's, there's a great many fantastic books that are self-published and there's a, a equal number that really needed the An editor of someone to say, stop being so in love with your own voice just because you're self-publishing doesn't mean right. that you don't regulate your worst instincts yeah mm -hmm. you just vomit it all out and then stick it up on amazon and hope people aren't going to notice yeah, because yeah. What, what happens is editorial feedback is a barrier between you and one star reviews that mm -hmm. doesn't exist when you self-publish and just don't bother paying attention to things yeah. like that. you know it gives you freedom but you shouldn't abuse it but also when people just you know slap up whatever it gives a bad name to indie publishing they're like oh it's your indie you aren't good enough to get with a traditional publisher which yeah. isn't necessarily the case because there's some fantastic indie pub stuff and then it's the one rotten apple sort of leads yeah. a bad taste in everyone's mouth for everybody and, and there are people who who bash oh that's indie i'm not going to read it you yeah know just straight up like it's know. not worthy just because they put it out themselves which is ridiculous right. and to a, a degree i get that because when the gold rush of amazon self-publishing started anyone who wanted to and that still applies today but it was worse in the beginning right mm -hmm. because people were just grabbing shit and shoving it up there without even opening it and people were reading that in droves because it was relatively new to them this ebook technology yeah looking at it on their kindle going what the fuck am i reading what is that <laughs> yeah and not formatted right poor, or poorly edited and yeah, also when we all started doing this none of us knew what the hell we were doing either so a lot yeah. of our earlier efforts looked like somebody just i don't know shot some legos onto a big watch <laughs> look like a ransom note with the cutouts and stuff yeah like the like the riddler made it <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 so yeah it's it's understandable to a degree but i mean the only way to resolve that is just to keep publishing high quality books and make sure you're giving the reader what they want. Yeah. I do think it has garnered more um, attention as far as, you know, people are enjoying indie stuff over the last couple of years or so, especially the indie horror community. Yeah. It's putting out some really great stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's, it's being legitimized slowly, but surely, you know, you see mm -hmm. people uh, getting movie deals and everything out of it and, Movie deals don't just come along, you know, and, and hand pick books from self-publishing. They just look for good books, period. Right. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whether you went to New York or you self-published it or what or stuck it up on your website. Mm -hmm. A good story will resonate and it will make waves and somebody will be surfing those waves who works for Hollywood. And then one thing leads to another. So yeah. I don't know. I'm delighted by some of the, the authors who have risen to prominence through self-publishing because without it we wouldn't have seen them yeah yeah and now you're seeing self-published stuff in like barnes and noble and stuff as yes. well and the, yeah. the brick and mortar stores which is good yeah where it should be yeah so how many uh stories if any did you shop around before you actually landed one for yourself i mean like i guess how many rejections did you get before they started realizing who you were and and, and taking your, your books and getting them out there for us hundreds okay mm-hmm but I've been writing uh, since I was about eight years of age, writing horror stories. I've been submitting them since I was 16. Right. Um, I remember getting ferociously drunk on my 18th birthday. <laughs> a story I sent to an Irish fiction magazine when I still lived in Ireland 
published it and I didn't know until I went into the news agent and found the magazine on the, the rack and I opened it and I was flipping through it. And there's my story. Mm -hmm. I went, holy shit, went out, got drunk. Now <laughs> I look back on it now and I realize a couple of things. One, they never notified me that they published it. Two, they didn't pay me. And three, they published everything that was sent to them. But for me, I oh. just walked into a store in Cork City, taken this magazine down, looked and saw my name in print on my 18th birthday. That was it. That was life changing yeah. for me. Yeah. Magazine was a pile of shit, but I didn't care. <laughs> so what is the um, horror what writing scene like that? in Ireland? You know, when I came here, I didn't believe there was one. Okay. And that has definitely changed. When, when did you, when the backtrack, when did you come to the States here? About two weeks after 9 11. Okay. Sorry, okay. about two weeks before 9 11. Before, yeah. Important distinction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think not only just Ireland, but I think globally, horror, I don't know, is becoming kind of the in thing again, you know, in right. publishing specifically. Mm hmm. People, I, I don't know what it is about when people sit down to write, whether they consider all the genres and, and figure horror will be the easiest. But a lot of people are doing it. And the Irish market for horror is magazines popping up all the time. There's the Irish Ghost Story Society. It's, I don't know, it's great. It's great to see it because I couldn't, like I said, when I left and came here, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you a single horror writer john connolly is probably one of the most famous and even though they publish his books as best-selling thrillers uh -huh. if those things are thrillers i swear to christ i'll eat my own face <laughs> <laughs> is he the one that has like the is he the detective series the one that was written yeah, the detective yeah, series the charlie parker yeah those, those are good messed up they're like not horror in the same way that the silence of the lambs is not horror yeah yeah well, it, that just goes back to what we say all the time with all of the different outlets with horror, all the subgenres under that umbrella. You yeah. Know, it, it, you got one slight gruesome thing. Oh, it's horror. You know, it's, it's whatever. Well, it's like somebody says what to me one time. They asked me what was the difference between crime and a thriller. Or sorry, yeah. horror and a thriller. And I said, mm -hmm. um, I don't know about that really. I said, sometimes the lines converge. They said, yeah. what do you mean? I said, well, I think if you put 10 bodies in a forest, that's a crime novel. Ten bodies in a forest. It's a mystery novel. Ten bodies in a forest, but there's a guy standing over them wearing a hockey mask and breathing funny. That's a horror. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. It's so random. It's the tiniest little thing. Yeah. That can, that can push a story over the line from thriller, mystery, crime into horror and vice versa. Well, I mean, I wonder if there's been some sort of, uh, I'm sure there has been some sort of study as far as which word to use to try to get more eyes on it thriller or you know are going to scare somebody off with the word horror to, i don't think promote that, it you know i don't think that publishers have ever liked the word horror i, yeah. I no. the reason that you'll have every iteration of mystery and thriller supernatural thriller paranormal mystery supernatural mystery ectoplasmic <laughs> whatever but you won't have horror yeah, and you know, horror, you, even the horror sections you go look for your, a novel you've heard is one of the best horror novels of the year you look at the horror section, it's not there. You'll probably mm -hmm. find it in the Twitter section. Right. They just don't have the confidence that they can sell it, but with that ugly ass word horror on the spine. And that's well, usually you, the you smallest section movies. in the bookstore, too. The horror yeah. section's like one bookcase and that's it. Yeah. And you yeah. see you see with movies too, they they do it. It's like the year's greatest thriller. And it's like you leave, you're like, Well, that was bloodier than Friday the thirteenth. What what are you talking <laughs> about? You know what I mean? So right. as Laurel says there in the comments, I find the difference is usually marketing, and that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. The amount of books that I have read that were absolute straight out balls to the wall horror and on the spine said thriller or mystery or anything else, literally anything else. Yeah. And it drives me nuts because it, it has been that way. You know, even when there was a horror boom in the 80s with the, with the zebra and the paperbacks, mm -hmm. they were fine putting horror on it. But because the quality declined over the years and you had shitty cover art that had nothing to do with the book inside and people right. were being led and they were getting exhausted from reading the same old recycled Stephen King bullshit. Yeah. They, they grew up thinking horror means only one thing. It's all the same crap. Mm -hmm. So when publishers decided to actually publish good horror novels again, they didn't want to use that label. They wanted to call it anything else. Like it had been tainted or something. 
yeah exactly yeah that it's still a ghetto genre like it's we can't say that word that's no nope, let's not do that yeah i feel like horror is still looked down upon like like we've had people before like oh you're an author what do you write horror like oh you write horror like they're just like slide it off like let's not talk about it anymore i used to have the greatest hesitation in in admitting it you know oh i write books do you wow what kind <laughs> supernatural mysterious thrillers yeah. <laughs> you know like, how you gonna spin that i write space erotica i mean how, yeah, how you gonna spin that you know it's it's <laughs> i really don't write i'm just kidding tenticular studies of other things yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I wanted to go this comment real quick before we go past it so kelly's talking about the spinebreakers book club which is a book club i half ass run but we're reading uh ken, <laughs> ken next month for our book club ah oh, sweet so it's gonna be exciting what do you think that's, I did, that's a divisive one i didn't realize it was southern gothic which makes me even more excited because i love southern gothic stuff set in alabama but uh yeah it's um man it's amazing all these years later because I, I i can't even remember when i wrote that but it's more than 10 years ago and people are still discovering it for the first time and coming back and you know saying just read your book and it's either one of the best things i've ever read or my god this is one of the worst things i've ever read. <laughs> I hope you die in your sleep but it's amazing i love that it still evokes a reaction all these years later yeah like, oh yeah i did write that didn't i yeah okay totally, totally <laughs> forgot horrible thing i wrote that's a disgusting thing oh, my god. uh so the turtle boy 2005 that was your uh bram stoker award winner book how far into your writing journal journey was that one i had been writing uh professionally for about three years i think okay and i, I had amassed probably about 100 rejections uh slowly but surely i started to get acceptance acceptances from when how i worked it was from non-paying to semi-pro to pro uh, i would send scatter shots and stories out in every direction you know we had we'll publish your story because we like you.com <laughs> the magazine of fantasy and science fiction on the other side and everything in between i would just hammer them with stories mm -hmm. So it, it paid off. I mean, it became my basically, you know, baptism by fire. Right. But I, I paid attention to the feedback I did get from, especially from the pros and semi-pros, you know, and even from some of the non-paying places who were just run by really cool people who knew what they were doing. And it was basically just a college education in writing at that time, you know, uh, all that feedback. Right. So, yeah, a couple of years later, I wrote The Turtle Boy. Uh, I talked to Richard Schismer about publishing it at, uh, for Cemetery Dance. And I don't know what happened in the line of communication, but he stopped responding for a while, and I assumed he wasn't interested. He ghosted you. <laughs> and then I told it, and he got back to me and said, hey, anyway, what were we saying? And I went, oh, never mind. Oh, no. <laughs> this is how he ended up publishing the sequels, that, uh, The Hides, because he said, if you ever write anything new for that, I'd love to take a look at it. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was amazing, the whole thing. I didn't go to the Bram Stoker Award ceremony because I thought there was absolutely no hope in hell I was going to win it. Just so why, you know, I was a broke ass writer. Am I going to buy a plane ticket, fly the way there just to go right. mm -hmm, for someone else? <laughs> but uh, it did. And I had to be told, I think, the following afternoon back on AOL Messenger. Remember that thing? <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 With I your dial up. With the dial up. <laughs> yeah. I get these congratulations. And I, I was like, I legitimately did not know what they were talking about. I was like, for what? uh yeah the bram stoker award and then i immediately started looking at the the results and then i called my mom she did a jig in the back garden Ireland. <laughs> that was that but i wasn't very long into into um writing full-time when that happened and i think that pretty much gave me the the drive to keep at it mm -hmm. so that just completely blow your mind that you won the stoker that year still does oh yeah still does i mean I, I forget all the time and i'll see it on the shelf upstairs and i'll just go shit that's right <laughs> so i mean what does that do winning that award for your future projects then i mean do you have a totally different mindset going into everything or it just it gave me i think it gave me a real boost in confidence and and kind of was just that stamp of approval right mm -hmm. that, 
this. You know what? You can do it. Because I remember when I was growing up, I was reading books by Dean Koontz. And on the inside, it was, he was president of the Horror Writers Association. He's won a Stoker Award. Anytime I'd see that on an author's bio, I would tell myself, I'd be 16 sitting in my bedroom and tell myself, one day, I'm going to win yeah. one of those. So it was just a kind of, I don't know, all felt like just pieces of a puzzle pushing me towards this as a career. Mm -hmm. Um. The market benefit, I don't think there are anything, there isn't too much too overt there. You know, you don't have, you don't wake up after winning a Stoke Award and people are trying to knock down your door with offers. Right. <laughs> well, you walk through the supermarket, I'm big shit now, you know. <laughs> yeah. You want me to sign that for you? What? You don't know me? I got a Stoker. <laughs> you don't know me? I'm Francis. <laughs> but uh, what it did do, though, is it's a nice thing to be able to put on your book covers forever yeah. after. You know, it, it adds a legitimacy to it. I think, even if it is just, an attention grabber, like you, you see that, and you're like, "Oh, wait, yeah, this is high class horror." Yeah, <laughs> have you read me? Right. <laughs> yeah. So you don't feel like it opened necessarily any doors after winning it necessarily with like making it easier no, to get with I other mean, publishers say, or whatnot. I wouldn't say that it's um, that maybe it's the same for everyone. It just didn't really for me. And I only I only recall that because I automatically assumed it would. Yeah. I was well, that's it. Here we go. Nothing. Cricket. <laughs> but it did, I think what it did for me in terms of my own self-confidence yeah. uh, with my writing is as good as having 10 publishing deals lined up for me. Because you know, writing is self-doubt. And this mm -hmm. this happening, whether it's just kind of a, a totem. Kind of was like going back to my 16 year old self and saying, you know, that thing that you really want to win when you're a professional writer, you're going to. And I don't know. It was actually a dream come true for me. So, whatever it did for me, other than that, professionally speaking, I don't know. I think it was minimal in terms of immediate, but I think I'm still seeing the benefits of it today, at least in terms of how I approach my own writing. I you were nominated a few times, though. Uh, with with uh yeah yeah other works right are, yeah. are those letdowns when you don't get them or is it just like yeah whatever i got one <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the absolute truth yeah i've already i've already won one i would much yeah. prefer if i'm nominated for something that it go to somebody who hasn't okay. yeah that said two of them would be great bookends one is kind of lame just in the middle <laughs> <laughs> if, I'm only saying that if they want to make up a, a reason to give me an award, a special category, like, I don't know, self-important asshole of the year stuff, <laughs> and then just fucking lob it through my window as a drive-by. <laughs> right. But I would honestly, if I'm nominated, I would love to see somebody who is my age when I, or younger even, when I won that award, mm -hmm. I would love to see them get that instead. Yeah. Because for what it, for what I just said, the the boost it gives your, you know, the, the sort of, drive sort of it you. kicks that imposter syndrome to the curb a little bit. Yeah, for a little while. Yeah, but yeah. it, um, yeah, no, I have one. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't need another one. I would, I would love for it to go to somebody who does want one and who does need that boost. Mm -hmm. Writing. I don't know if Laurel's saying you truly are an asshole or what she's trying to say. <laughs> well, it, whatever it is, she's not wrong. <laughs> Thanks, Laurel. <laughs> so the with the Turtle Boy, that's the Timmy Quinn series, right? It's yeah. is it five books? Oh Jesus. Uh I think so. Did it start out to be a series or just start out to be a standalone and it you went on from there? It did actually start out as just one book, but it kept, the character kept coming back to me at various points in his life, and I wonder where would what would his life look like if mm -hmm. that was his childhood? What would it look like in his twenties? What would it look like in his thirties, his forties? And the stories, as soon as I started to think that, the stories would come very easily. So I uh, I sat down and wrote them, and then I took a two year break from writing uh, real world interference. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought I probably was never going to write again, mm -hmm. but I came back and the first thing I did when I come came back was write the final book. That was my way back in. Okay, so with sort People of some familiarity. 
Yeah, but also people have been sending me death threats. So, you know, <laughs> don't George or Martin this bitch. Like, <laughs> okay. Just leave everybody hanging. How's it yeah. end? How's, yeah. Not even just hanging with the plot, but leave it mid sentence. And then <laughs> admitted it all along it was. <laughs> no one knows. <laughs> Nobody knows or ever finds out. So, how, how do you. Do you like doing series like that, or do you, would you rather do like one-offs, like Ken or Rod? You, you said you're working on a next part, but I don't. Um, the Timmy Quinn series was kind of exhausting because it's a long time to spend with one character or with uh, the same series of character in the same universe. Right. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do something like George does. I couldn't write door stoppers set in in that universe. Yeah. Um, I'm always very, very intrigued by like thoughts will come unbidden about characters from Kin, for example, or from Master of the Moors. Any of the novels that I've written, I do sometimes wonder where those characters are, or a story will immediately present itself to me, start, middle, and end. Like, hey, go do that with your Kin characters. And I'm like, no, I don't <laughs> want to. but I can't shake it. So. Mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to doing series, but my series would probably be two or three related books and not 25 volume. More like spinoffs or something like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe take a character and dive into that character's background. Yeah. I got Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Sour Candy, now a graphic novel I saw earlier this year, correct? Yeah. How, yeah, how did that nice. come to be? Um, I had adapted a couple of short stories for John Carpenter's um, Tales for a Halloween Night series of graphic okay. novel anthologies. Right. Um, and I deal primarily with his wife, Sandy King Carpenter. And I wrote to her one night during the pandemic when we were just first starting the lockdown thing. And I said, listen, if you guys are reading for anything longer, let me know. And she said, oh, yeah, you should do one for our night terrors. And I said, that's cool. What the hell's that? <laughs> So she told me, she said, oh, it's basically what we have been doing, except it's a single story and it's about 100 pages. Mm -hmm. So I sent her Sarah Candy and I said, do you think this would work? And she went, oh, holy shit, yeah, get to work. <laughs> so I wrote it. I wrote the comic book script for it. It took me about three months. And yeah, that was it. We got uh, Jason Felix on board to do the arts and Janice Chang to do the lettering. And it was just, honest to God, it was saved my sanity during the pandemic, but also... It was just kind of a dream team and right. a dream project. So I loved it. I mean, it was it was a fantastic experience. So how much say did you have in the actual art coming from one art guy to someone else doing the art for you? I will say that I have done adaptations, comic book adaptations before, where I like to give the artist total freedom. You know, I don't mm -hmm. want to be rigid unless it's something that absolutely has to be conveyed. But in terms of style or in terms of flourishes, I, I prefer for them to do their own thing. And with this, I was lucky that Jason basically just took snapshots of everything I saw in my mind and put them in the graphic novel. Cool. It was yeah. crazy. Because I had a dream that John Carpenter directed a Sour Candy adaptation of film. So if we're not going to get that because he's retired, well, his name is on this and that'll do. You yeah. Know? He directed the graphic novel. <laughs> So, the, so now, if, if the movie's ever made, his names could be connected somehow because it'd be the movie based on the graphic novel, based on the book, <laughs> based by, on the book. Yeah, yeah, based on, based on, based on. Yeah. <laughs> Was well, it a different? So the the both the novella and the graphic novel were optioned recently for film. So I don't know what they're going to draw from. Mm -hmm. But um, Sandy King and John Carpenter on board as producers, should it become a reality? So that'd be cool. Yeah. So now, I mean, Sour Candy's been adapted about eight friggin' times. So I'm not hopeful, but we'll see. Like with with it being a graphic novel and a, a, the book, could two separate companies adapt it two different ways, or is that like, are they not able to do that contract contractually and stuff? No. Um, well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't let that happen. I would. Okay. If they want the novella, that's cool. If they want the graphic novel, that's cool. If they mm -hmm. want to make one adaptation using both sources, that's mm -hmm. fine too. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't split them that way because that just sounds like it would. I just be didn't know if that was even possible, like legally with contracts and stuff. Or no, no, no. I mean, I think that anybody who's interested in wants both anyway. 
yeah to, to avoid that very thing mm -hmm. so. yeah. are the are is the story different uh from the graphic novel to the novella or are they pretty much the same it's a little bit different i added some stuff in there that's not in the novella for two reasons one because there were parts once sour candy was out and everyone had read it there were parts i regretted not putting in there mm -hmm. two i threw a little bit of the prequel novella which i am writing as well uh in there okay um and also to appeal to people who had read the novella and wanted some new stuff you yeah, know well, so i'm actually yeah, yeah exactly yeah a couple of little so is the pre is the prequel called less sour candy I'm just <laughs> that was horrible. Sweet. No, sweet it's candy. called gummy worms. Sweet candy. Yeah. Gummy worms. <laughs> sweet tarts. Yeah. Sore candy. <laughs> you have um the house on Abigail Lane. That's been option for film as well. Is that correct? TV. And Blinky. Yeah. TV. Um, mm -hmm. Blinky also. Did I see that? Blinky. Blinky yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um like anything, it sounds exciting to talk about it, but the reality of it is for as long as I've been doing this stuff of mine has been optioned by Hollywood and I get all excited. I used to get really excited about it and mm -hmm. watch as the years go by as the interest peters and you start hearing less and less from the people who optioned it. And then you just realize, Oh yeah, it's never going to happen. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know what's, what's in development right now. looks pretty good, but uh, who knows? I'll be back like, here. Time when, when, when you say, when you say TV, you you mean like, like, what, Hulu, Netflix, something like that? Or are you talking it's about like CBS? It not work yet, but it's the production company has uh, a showrunner, a writer, um, and they're shopping it out to those places. So, okay, okay, I got you. Yeah. yeah. If all of them pass, then who knows? That could be the end of it, but we'll see. Like, do they do they communicate with you very much during that process, or did you just is it... not? Oh, I, that okay. hasn't been my experience with everyone, but I've been really lucky over the last two years or so that the people interested in in these books and in developing them into something have been really really communicative it's you mm -hmm. know i'll get an email before they do anything as if they think i'm going to object you know <laughs> hey we're sending this to steven spielberg i'm like oh that hack okay <laughs> don't want him doing it yeah yeah well, could we literally have somebody else but uh it, it's no it's great i appreciate it i don't expect it at all but it's definitely nice to see it I guess it, I guess it'll depend on maybe the book, but would you prefer something to be adapted to film or TV where you can have more time to sort of deal with the characters and whatnot? Or does it not really matter? I think what's being uh, what has been adapted, um, or sorry, optioned, mm -hmm. and for the formats they have in mind, I think they suit those projects best. Yeah. Like for example, I can't really envision a sour candy or blanky TV series, but I absolutely can for the House of Abigail Lane. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because the House of Abigail Lane, the way it's set up, isn't tied to any one timeline or, or mm -hmm. even to one property. So, yeah, I mean, and I don't I don't mind. I mean, people have optioned short stories of mine that were five pages long with a view to making a TV show out of them. And I'm like, basically, it's a five page jump scare. <laughs> going with this? Yeah. How are you going to make a TV show out of that? But ultimately, I don't care if they want it and they want to pay me for it. I was going to say, I mean, it comes down to money. <laughs> so. Give me that so I can afford to keep being alive. And then, you know, you make your whatever the crap and good on you. Yeah, yeah I, I can totally see. I finished the house on Abigail Lane earlier today, and I can totally see that being a TV show with the different, you know, it's going through like from 56 up until almost current. Yeah. Throughout, yeah. throughout the years, different different occurrences in the house and stuff. Right, and based on you know, spoiler, uh, it it doesn't have to be set there. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a house. It right. can be whatever. But yeah, definitely, I'd love I'd love to see that happen actually. And usually, I'm kind of ambivalent about some of the things that have been optioned because I don't particularly like the stories. Mm -hmm. So I'm there going, okay, well, if you can go and make it better, brilliant. <laughs> but there are a couple that are really, really close to my heart, and I would say the house in Abigail Lane is one of those. I just. Mm -hmm. Primarily because it was so much fun to write it. Um, and I, I do think that in the right hands, that would be kind of the show I would like to watch, you know, like yeah. by somebody else. I would be excited seeing previews of that kind of show. Mm -hmm. So I just want to watch it. So if, if you don't mind, 
before we get into that you're gonna do a little maybe read a little passage yeah. from it but let's let's break things up do like a little get to know lightning round yeah fun sure. game here to get you loose before the reading if you don't mind <laughs> Get Brad, that was, your, that, that was your cue to have everything ready. What happened? I'm pulling. I'm pulling it up, man. Man, we, we take a few weeks off, and this is the I'm slow. I'm, 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 I'm rusty. I'm rusty. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna play a lightning round. So Jay's gonna put 60 seconds oh, on his that, clock. I guess that's my part. Too, See, right? Jay, come on. You're you're slacking too, man. Come on now. I'm Thank gonna you. ask you as many questions and just answer them as quick as you can. Just first thing that comes to mind. Oh shit! All right. <laughs> But the house on Abigail Lane, while he's pulling that up, not to give anything away, but it sort of reminds me in a sort of roundabout way of the, the laugh, Lovecraft Country that they did for HBO. I could sort of see something similar. God, I, love that. I loved that show, actually, when it was when it was on. I was kind of bummed that they canceled it. They canceled it, yeah. They canceled all the good stuff. Yeah. All right. You ready to do this? All right. You ready? And... Got to do our production. Got forgot about the intro. Sorry. Yeah. Got the intro. All right. All right. 60 ahead, seconds. Ready? ready and go. What's your favorite TV show of all time? Oh, God, this sucks. Um, <laughs> Matlock. What Colum would your weapon of... Columbo, what would your weapon of choice be in the zombie apocalypse? Uh, a rocket launcher. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Invisibility. What's your favorite band? Soundgarden. Thank you. Your dream vacation spot. Maldives. Your favorite horror movie. The Thing. The worst thing you've ever eaten. The Thing. <laughs> <laughs> Ten seconds. <laughs> that threw me off. What's your favorite season? Fall. What's the most treasured book that you own? Assigned uh, Jack Katie anthology. 60. Nice. Tell someone yeah, a fun fact there. about yourself. Hmm? Tell someone a fun fact about yourself other than your middle name is Francis. I'm no good at lightning rounds. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, you know what? It. Normally I'm a lot better than that, but I literally, I'm, I'm working on about three hours of sleep. So <laughs> I think I'm even upright. I think when Mark Taus was on, he just sat and, thought about the first question for like 30 seconds I, yeah. the answer. I don't like lightning rounds because i i always give the wrong answers for the most part and <laughs> i really want to elaborate on some of the answers you know well, well I, I think i told you i wanted to do something with with your tiktoks because now you're like world famous tiktok guy now world uh, you, you show off yeah i mean i i don't know how to work at half the time but uh i don't you know, we, we both work all the time we're like we that's what we came up with the lightning round before we could, <laughs> before we had a chance to make anything for the TikTok. Well, he but. can he can do some uh, some Irish terms and see if Jay can guess what it means. Oh, I'm not gonna guess them. I have not at all. I mean, <laughs> you're I've horrible. Even, I've even watched the videos and I'm like, what? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I think that I'm offering a public service, and yeah. also <laughs> one of the reasons behind the TikTok is just to avoid future St. Patrick's Day where I get asked the stupidest fucking. <laughs> I've ever heard in my life, you know. People walk up to me and say, "You're from Ireland, yeah." Jesus, do you have you jukeboxes over there? <laughs> like, why wouldn't we? Because the donkey couldn't pull it up the fucking hill. <laughs> <laughs> do you get a lot of stuff like that? Ask about like leprechauns and all that kind of stuff, like stereotypical you'd be stuff. You'd be, and, really? and it's not, you know what? Nobody's kind of that blatant about it. What they'll do is, we'll say an example like this uh, podcast. Mm -hmm. You'll advertise it, but my name will be festooned with shamrocks, or you'll suddenly <laughs> talk in a brogue like, "Well, sure, we can't fucking believe it, but Friday night, sure, we have the owl himself, the old fucking <laughs> Paddy, me fucking gee up there with the clovers." <laughs> that's gonna be. Uh, I'm glad I didn't do that. Now, <laughs> yeah, well, that's gonna <laughs> Nothing be I even... tomorrow when we when we, when we advertise for the show a little bit more. But like, hey, yeah. We found that pot yeah. of gold at the end of the, end of the rain. <laughs> We've seen 28 days later. 28 days yeah. after you see that, you see my rage virus. <laughs> and he, he just like, replies on Twitter with the, just the middle yeah. finger emoji. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He'll block us. Let's let us yeah. all of this. <laughs> but it's usually, it's actually never insidious. It's the worst thing ever is because it's always well meant. The yeah. same as anytime somebody meets me in person, they cannot control themselves 
<laughs> and immediately imitate my accent to my face. Oh, <laughs> this is this nice. Jan from New York. Hi, Keelan. Nice to meet you. Oh, so nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I can't do accent or I would just hop into one right now. So. No, don't do it, Jay. They never do it to anybody else. You're not going to meet a Frenchman. I know. It's like, you know, it's just <laughs> always with your voice, your voice. Though, I could totally listen to you narrate an audiobook and just be mesmerized the whole time. People have said that to me, but I, I can't listen to my own voice for that long. Yeah. I hate my, I cannot listen to myself, but I would totally listen to you narrate an audiobook. Well, that's lovely to hear. I might consider, I, you know, I could narr narrate a short story, maybe. But mm -hmm. yeah. my own books, like people there going, oh, Jesus, love the accent. What was the book about? Couldn't fucking tell you. <laughs> I, I think I'd get bored halfway through it and get tired of the book, like read something else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> turn, it, turn it in. Turn it in to the, whoever's paying me. And they're like, that's the wrong book. Yeah, I got bored <laughs> on that one. <laughs> and people can't always understand me. So my audio book would have to have subtitles. <laughs> It just be it just be like an announcer. What he was saying there is he just said, and you might have missed it. Was <laughs> hello, my it's name just... is Patrick Francis Burke. Exactly. <laughs> it's just like the the Siri robot, just monotone, just saying it. That's right. right. I don't understand what this bollocks is saying. <laughs> It'd be like an autocorrect. I didn't mean that. <laughs> I'd have to auto tune myself. <laughs> Can you imagine that? The man well, walked up the hill. <laughs> Well, Rebecca's trying to influence you to mess with the stuff on Twitter tomorrow, Jay. Putting all the <laughs> shamrocks and stuff on there. Don't do it. That would be cruel. Don't I'll do it. Rebecca, I remember that. Yeah. I always remember like, the instigators. Those jackasses. He'll still tell everybody not to come on our show. <laughs> it's hard enough to get guests yes. the way it is. Come on. I'll be outside in a trench coat with a sandwich board going, stay away from him. Exactly. <laughs> so, so on that note. Uh, you you want to? Wanna... <laughs> we'll read a little something, and Jay will dub it over for you while you're reading it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can what he it. was saying there is <laughs> yeah, that word he pronounced funny was the. <laughs> All right, so, so you want to read some of this? We're doing this house, right. The house, house of Abigail Lane. That's right. Yeah, I'll just hold up the, the picture for everybody here. <laughs> oh, good. That's handy. I don't have to do it. All right. How long do I have? How much do you want? This is as long as long or short as you want. All right, I won't. I won't make it too long because I don't want to bore okay. people. But all right. The earliest known disappearance is that of fifty-eight-year-old Elmore Washington during the construction of the house in June of nineteen fifty-six. Then, as now, there was little to distinguish number 56 from the 22 identical houses that comprised the newly built neighborhood of Abigail Lane. And on that fine summer day 60 years ago, it was starting to come together nicely. The air was punctuated by the bark of hammers and the growl of saws, of machinery grumbling, of trucks grinding their way over the as yet unpaved streets and driveways. A haze of dust hung over everything. The rough framing had been completed, the plywood sheathing applied to the skeletons of the houses, and the doors and windows had been installed. According to his co-workers, Elmore, who had been working primarily on the roof that day, hadn't exhibited any noticeable sign of preoccupation. He was known as a jovial, quick-witted sort, slow to anger unless raging drunk, in which case Jeb Foreman said later, he'd pick a fight with a chair and probably lose. He was not given to moods or depression. If there were demons nestled in the folds of his life, he kept them to himself. All of which made it even more of a mystery that in the middle of an ordinary workday, he vanished and was never seen again. His co-worker, Jeb Forum, Foreman, who was not the foreman because that would have been a little too perfect, says the last time he saw Elmore, he was entering the house to retrieve his lunch pail, which he'd left somewhere on the second floor. Jeb claimed he saw Elmore mount the stairs, saw those big size 11s of his clomping up the steps, and didn't give it a second thought until close to quitting time when Ronald Mayhew, who was the foreman, asked if Elmore had left early. Figuring maybe he'd snuck away for a quick nap, they looked for him. On the stairs in number 56, they found his lunch pail. The bologna sandwich and apple rotted as if it had been sitting in the sun for two weeks 
and another item everyone was pretty sure Washington wouldn't have left behind on purpose, which was when it was decided that the police should be called. All anyone knew was that wherever Washington had gone, he'd traveled there without his car, a 1953 Packard Clipper, parked at the construction site, and $80 worth of savings he'd kept in a mason jar beneath his bed. He had never married, wasn't known as a ladies' man, on account of badly pockmarked skin and a glass eye, so he left no broken hearts behind, only a mother who suffered from dementia and likely died never knowing he disappeared. What he did leave behind was the eye, which Jeb and Ronald discovered sitting on the second to last step of the stairs. That thing put the fear of God into me, Ronald said, like the Poe story about the fellow with the big eye looking at that man like it knew all he'd done. Jeb said he felt sick after emerging from the house. For some reason I can't figure I couldn't stop clenching my teeth. The air was all wrong in there. I smelled fresh cut grass and there ain't a thing wrong with a smell like that, but it made me sick to my stomach. Before he lost his lunch on the bare earth of the soon to be lawn, Jeb told his wife he could have sworn he saw sunflowers there just for a moment, right where someone in the future would undoubtedly put them. He made her promise she'd never share what he said. The men will think I've gone soft in the head. And she didn't, until the documentarian Mike Howard came calling some six years after lung cancer made her a widow. Of all the theories put forth at the time to explain what had become of Washington, which ranged from the possible, he'd been suffering from depression and to spare his mother the distress, had committed suicide somewhere the body was not likely to be discovered, to the highly improbable. He was a communist sympathizer who had been called back to Mother Russia for an important assignment. Nobody ever blamed the house. I love the uh, just how subtle certain parts just kind of just grab you at certain points. So, yeah. That was the house on Abigail Lane. Here's the one you're looking for, everyone. You did that cover, right? I did, yeah. I love the eye on the sunflower. <clears throat> it's amazing how many people have this book, have read it, and a year later, we'll take it down and go, Jesus, there's an eye in it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was totally not expecting the way the story's told. It's almost like this sort of document uh, documentary, and which I love the way it was told. I was not expecting it to be told like that, though. That's a, precisely why I did it, is because I kind of imagined it as something I'd be watching on Netflix as a six-part mm -hmm. series or something. And I wanted to have a kind of a true crime feel to it which is not something yeah. i've ever seen before so it was exciting to try something in that format and uh mm -hmm. people seem to have responded well to it uh, occasionally somebody will say i just wish you'd written it some other way but i mean <laughs> i'll die and every single book i have written somebody will say that to me about it you know or i just wish you hadn't written it at all that's the review i'm going to start leaving for you on goodreads i wish you would have <laughs> written it a different way cool just <laughs> I'll tell Francis to expect it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Do you? Um, so did you go, go ahead, go ahead. So I want to so hop into you, some of his artwork here in a minute. So go ahead and finish your your. Did story. you um? Did you approach writing it this way differently than you do your normal stuff? Like, did you any do any more sort of research to make it feel more like a documentary? Or yeah, I did because um, it was kind of important to me that that the. Uh, timeline wove itself in and out of real events mm -hmm. where possible real historical events so that it blurred the line between what was real and what wasn't yeah which, which of course is what the the characters experience as well and i wanted it to be kind of an off kilter so that it's presented almost coldly and clinically like just a statement of facts mm -hmm. you know here's the evidence read it see what you think make up your mind believe it or don't and I know it hasn't worked for everybody and you know some people have, are not shy about telling me that but it was so much fun to write that and to say okay so when at this point in the narrative when the house goes ape shit what was what was happening in real world history yeah and sifting through all the things that happened to say yeah this is perfect and here's why people were paranoid at this time in history so the mm -hmm. house the house would have gone unnoticed by the world at large, but not by the neighborhood it's in, because people yes. were, weren't trusting each other. Right. So it was a blast. I, I had so much fun writing that. Uh, there was one point in there where you were talking about a fiction, a book that was written about the house, House of Death by Scott Tiller, 
you said it was zebra books uh google that was like is that a real book <laughs> yeah i love that it's one of my favorite things a lot of people have said that they a few people said they actually looked up the house in abigail lane to see if it's based on a house yes. on abigail lane and it's not of course but i love that that gives me a real a real thrill because that people would read that and then go okay i need to know how much of this is true like it's, just that little detail of saying it was a zebra books in what 1985 was like that's okay i gotta see if this is a real book now right yeah I did actually at one point, this is not something I've ever told anybody. I did have the, uh, what are they called? The paranormal investigators from the conjuring and all that shite. Uh, what's... Oh, the, the Warrens, Elizabeth and Lorraine, well, Lorraine Warren. I can't Lorraine think of the guy's name. Lorraine. I, and, uh... them, I did have the Warrens in it at one point. Did you? I, cut them. I cut them during editing because all I read was that they were incredibly litigious people. Oh yeah. Even their estate is still very, you know, and it, not that I was worried about getting sued, but that I didn't want to hold the book up with that bullshit. Yeah. It's, yeah. I wanted it out there. I didn't want to have a team of lawyers having to go through it for a very innocuous mention of them. Yeah. So I just decided to end to strike it and publish it without them. It's just the one you would want to give to someone if they're just getting into your work. Yeah. It's as good a place to start as any. The only risk in that is that it's not written in the voice I usually use. Right, right. It's, it's <laughs> more of the, like you said, like the true crime kind of oh, historic totally way. But yeah, I would say Sour Candy and Blanky would be better places to start to get a feel for, you know, what I do. Mm -hmm. right. I read uh, The Tent a while back. I, I like, because it took place in Hocking Hills. And I, I've been, I used to go to Old Man's Cave a lot when I was younger. And I took my kids like this at the beginning of summer for the first time. Uh, and my wife, and the whole t well they want to do the whole long trail you know i want to do just a short one because i'm old now <laughs> but they yeah. did the whole thing and the whole time i'm like you know you could really get lost in here you went off the if you go off the the trail the right way you get lost and now then i read the tent and i'm like holy shit <laughs> oh yeah it's i'll tell you the tent was a bonkers one that's one of the stories there's about two of them but that's one of those stories i remember sitting down to dinner and having an idea for a development it's actually in the that. collection i have here it's the novellas the novellas okay. yeah i had a, i had the idea like i had written some of the tent and i was sitting here eating dinner and a plot twist came into my head uh -huh. to, do, to do with the central villain of that mm -hmm. and i just dropped what i was eating and ran upstairs <laughs> typed away that's another one that was so much fun because it's just dumber than a bag of rocks, but it was a hell of a blast <laughs> to write it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, the, the one said, guy, uh, I was getting annoyed with them, uh, uh, the guy, the, the main guy. I, I, I can't think. It's been a few weeks, but I was getting annoyed with him just the way he was acting. Oh, he's such a tool. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then for them to have, like, the kid goes missing, but then they start having this conversation about their relationship. I'm like, the kid's missing. Look for the fucking kid. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I one of the biggest criticisms I got for that, and I love it, and I completely agree with it, is he's such a spineless asshole. Yeah. I said, well, I couldn't relate to him because I said, well, I'm glad you couldn't. I'm glad you're not a spineless <laughs> asshole. <laughs> but I don't apologize for it because he needed to be that way for the story. And, you know, I thought he sucked eggs as well. But it was fun to write about somebody who just left his spine at home. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Do you set quite a bit of your stories in Ohio? Because a uh, house that Abigail Lane is, I think Turtle Boy is. It sounds like the tent is. Yep, I do. Yeah, um, I have set some in Ireland. I've set some in other places. There's one that's uh, I'm working on that's based basically in every state out west, from Ohio to California. Okay. Based on a road trip I took that was that. Um, mm -hmm. All about those the, the relics, the Americana. That you encounter on the way out there and the weird shit on the side of the road yeah oh yeah yeah it's uh so it's in multiple states but i tend to write where i spend the most time mm -hmm. now this new one cottonmouth is a different species of thing because i don't know why it occurred to me to set it there well there was a couple of reasons but i can't say it without it being a spoiler <laughs> and i went there to yeah immerse myself in that so yeah, that's why I was in Tennessee because I wanted, I wanted to be as authentic as possible with a story like this because it tackles some pretty heavy themes and it's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty messed up. So I need to get it right. 
I need you're to like get the uh, Deidre Day Lewis of the writing world. You have to go to where <laughs> your story is to absorb it and get I mean, characters. Message, message writing. Yeah. 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 You know how you method write? You write method. <laughs> <laughs> but um, right? There you go. Yeah. 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 So if you ever wanted to write a story in Kentucky, I would gladly take that because we don't get many horror stories written in Kentucky. Well, yeah. Kentucky is a horror story. So that's. Hey, hey now. I, I, Keesling wrote Devil's Creek, and that's like the only one I know off, off the top of my head that's set in Kentucky. See, the thing is, like, I mean, some of these states are so similar, and I don't say that disparagingly. I mean, Kentucky's yeah. gorgeous, Tennessee's beautiful. But it's like where I'm from, Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, they're yeah. interchangeable, narratively speaking. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to set a story anywhere else unless there's actually a legitimate reason for it to be set there. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm not going to say this story is set in Pennsylvania or it's set in Idaho. If it needs to be a story that's set out west, the milestone stories were all set out in Arizona. Uh, I had been there when I got the idea for those. But if it if it can be set in Ohio, it should be because this is where I am and I know what I'm looking at. Right. Yeah. And if it can't, I have to go to wherever it is set, immerse myself in that so I know what I'm talking about it and write about it. Yeah. Does it ever happen the other way around? Instead of you going to a place to write the story, do you ever go somewhere and that inspires you to write a story instead? It has done, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it has. Um, for example, the trip out west, mm -hmm. two of them I've taken. One, The first was 10 years ago on, on Route 66. Mm. That inspired the Milestone Stories, which is a collection, another collection. And the second was last year, I want to say, out to Yellowstone. Okay. which has inspired a novella that's coming as well but yeah so definitely definitely i was hugely inspired um in tennessee actually it was i could have stayed there it's pretty nice when you're up in the mountains away from the pigeon yeah. forge crowd and stuff damn it was it was beautiful up there i was i was kind of enchanted by the whole thing did which you see any bears that? while you were there you know what i have it on video on my TikTok. i did uh oh, yeah. One of them was on the porch fucking around with the furniture. Okay. So I went and grabbed the phone and I filmed him walking away from the, from the window. <laughs> like, be an asshole. Were you, in a, were you in a cabin or were you in a hotel somewhere? I was in a cabin yeah. right so I, on top of the woods with a view yeah. of the Smoky Mountains. It was absolutely it's astonishing. Yeah, every but time we go, it's yeah, got the trash the cans all locked up and everything. Oh, they were. Yeah, they're caged yeah. up their yeah. pads. Crazy. Never been spoken. I've been to Gatlinburg, but that's that's during the Tennessee. Gatlinburg is lovely too. Yeah, yeah. I was there you, as well. Yeah. In fact, through that in fact, that in one fact. mile of road that's all tourists. Once you get past that, it's good. It takes oh, you yeah. like an hour to drive down that road. <laughs> the whole friggin' like, what is it like hillbilly Vegas? That yeah. whole yeah. that's insane. I yeah. actually, I'm gonna tell you though, I have got I've got kind of a, I'm not into touristy stuff, but I love how gaudy all that is. It is. Just to drive it's like through. there's like a thousand pancake houses, and there's all the there people is. believe the, it or not stuff. Down every there. quarter, they're trying to sell you a timeshare. That's like right. we, we, that's where we went for our, our anniversary. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it actually tomorrow, seventeen years. Wow. Yeah. 17, wow, Jay. I'm glad you remember. 50, 57? <laughs> 57 years tomorrow. Yeah. Do the math, guys. Um, but yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know if Gatlinburg is still like that. I just I, I just remember every corner was like trying to sell you a timeshare like, timeshares oh. and t-shirts and geodes and uh there's yeah. the moonshine place old smoky mountain moonshine right yeah. yeah no it was uh i loved gatlinburg actually but i when i say that i mean i i like the the rural aspect of it you know right. yeah once you get past that strip then you're actually you in the mountains. That, you're actually yeah exactly yeah. Cool. Yeah. do you do all of your uh covers for all your books or every single one of them um if another publisher or a publisher who primarily does their own artwork or works with an in-house artist mm -hmm. publishes something of mine, then I will get out of the way and let them do their thing. But if I'm doing my own books, I do all the covers. Yeah. And you market them under your, how do you, is it Elder El Lemon? Is Elder it? Lemon. Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure I was saying it. Cause like it is. So, um, do we want to get into, uh, the silver shamrock stuff or <laughs> don't ask me ask on... him. well i mean because those were they're... it was a, to a point where it was like oh that's a keelan patrick burke cover it was like just automatic was a just patrick burke automatic cover. you know and then 
now it's not happening anymore. You know, we're like, hey, we want some Keelan art. Well, I'm still doing them. I'm still doing them. I actually yeah. uh, think I've done 10 in the last month and a half. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was kind of crazy. They were I was getting them to do them so much. I wasn't getting to write as much. OK, yeah. You know, and I couldn't really complain about it, but it was definitely starting to take its toll where I was falling behind on writing projects. Um, mm -hmm. I was late in stuff I was turning in and that started to piss me off because I, I, I try to be. I try to be timely with yeah. stuff I promised people, you know, I mean, they were releasing a lot of books regularly. It was like, so yeah. And it was like, book, was it was almost like a book a week. Cover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what it felt like. Yeah. So yeah, it actually, the current situation suits me in mm -hmm. creatively speaking. It's great because I have kind of an even split now, yeah. but yeah. Um, that whole thing was a pain in the ass. Yeah. So it, you don't have to go to total detail, but like for the ones that you did for authors that now are shopping their books around to other people, did they get to keep the covers? Did you guys work out a deal or how, how did that work out? Yeah, I told them they could have them for the new edition. Okay. And I told their new publishers that I would amend them to take the logos off and put theirs mm -hmm. on and resize them, whatever they needed. Okay. Yeah. So, so when you was, sorry. sorry, go ahead. It was just kind of a <clears throat> small bit of a gesture to ameliorate the absolute clusterfuck that whole situation was. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but it was unpleasant for everybody. I mean, I was getting fucking death threats and everything, which was unbelievable. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. But it also, you know, it it had some good come out of it because I, I learned the value of being more careful with the projects I agreed to do covers for, because to that yeah. point, I, I don't read the books. I go on what I'm given. This is what I would like to see on the cover. Right. Just, right. Yeah. You know, design that shit and give it to them. That's what I wanted to say too. Like you, you don't really know what's happening in a book or anything. It's just like, Hey, no, because I mean, it's, it's impractical for me to, especially with the volume of books I was getting just right. from them. And I yeah. was getting covers from other people too. <clears throat> cover requests i there's no absolutely there's, no way i would have the time to read all of those books and then come up with an idea for the cover i i would literally get nothing else done yeah so and it's just not how it works anyway i mean everybody seems to know that when they come to you they tell you what they want to see mm -hmm. and you give that to them that's it yeah. that was my involvement and it all went to shit. so but yeah we moved on life goes on the people who needed to go the fuck away have thankfully <laughs> so, so you, with, you're, you're still selling covers through your outer lemon outer lemon design right oh yeah yeah it's still there there's okay. a disclaimer that states very clearly we do not endorse the books that we do covers for to the best of our abilities we we go based on the theme of the book right uh-huh We'll ask questions of authors to, to know if there are any sensitive content we should be aware of, because basically I got roped into the whole thing for not asking those questions. I didn't think yeah. I needed to, but yeah. clearly you do. So now I do. So like if someone's looking for a, you to do their cover art, is there anything like guidelines you have as far as what they need to tell you? Like, do you want to be told like the synopsis or they want this certain thing on the book or? Well, I mean, it's, it, should be, it should be kind of obvious, but that if your book even has a whiff of being sympathetic or promoting white supremacist ideals or ideology yeah. or racism or hate or anti LGBTQ, anything like that, mm -hmm. just fucking draw it yourself and leave me out of it. You know? <laughs> I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with it, but yeah. unfortunately that situation happened because I didn't ask the right questions because I wasn't aware at the time that that was what I should be doing. I just give me the idea and I'll do the cover and there you go. Mm -hmm. It never happened before where suddenly somebody is saying the jacket copy of this book is potentially racist, which right. means it's potentially racist, which means the author is potentially racist, which means you did the cover. So you are as well. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> so what? Are, are you, are you getting that information from the publisher? Or are you get information from, from the author. It depends. Because, if an author comes to me, then I would obviously deal with them directly. Right. 
in this case, it was the publisher provided me with a design brief. Uh, that's what I was trying to get at because because I'm I've I've we've all seen different stories floating around. You know, like the author didn't know the publisher was promoting it that particular way, and yeah, you see what you yeah, got. So. It, was, it was a mess, but I mean, <laughs> it was interesting for me because before I got to make a statement about the whole thing to clear it up for for everybody. I was kind of, uh, I was kind of a little bit stung by some of the people who w were quick to turn on me, you know. Yeah. yeah. Like I've, I've, I've tried to be helpful to people in the in in the industry as long as I've been doing it, and it just seemed really, really quick for some people to decide. Oh yeah, what a prick! Let's mm -hmm. be done. With him. So I don't know, but whatever. I guess that's and, and that, that's social media too. It's like when people see people piling on, they just want to join in. You know, I, I I don't I don't get it. But well, I mean, at the end of the day, all that matters is that people don't get hurt. You know, and yeah. I was sick to my stomach for about three months after that incident because it, right. I felt like you know, however it happened, I ended up involved in a situation where people thought less of me and they thought that I was the kind of person who would willingly be uh, that kind of asshole. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but aside from that situation, I mean, yeah, you still have that kind of asshole. <laughs> right. Yeah. So aside, aside from that whole debacle, that whole situation, you have plenty of covers for people. People are still getting covers from you. Uh, what, what What's your background as far as the art goes? Do you do all these yourself? Do you have somebody that helps you out? Or you no, just... no. I do them myself. I mean, it's a combination of stock art design, manipulation, uh, Photoshop. I will sometimes use my own photography. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say, just in closing to that, that I think that whole stuff with Silver Shamrock and being kind of thrown out there to be the whipping boy for it all, it, it's kind of killed my taste for it, oh, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think I can. I can actually, for the first time since I start started doing it, see an end to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because it's just I, I don't know. I mean, if I write something in, insensitive in a book of mine and somebody calls me out, well, that's great. You know, I own it. Shit. Mm -hmm. You know, fuck. I should have known better. You know, and I'm very careful in that regard. But when I design a book cover for somebody and then it explodes because the book itself is about something, a book I haven't read, right? And people paint you with the same exact brush. Yeah. As as everybody else, I, I'm. It kind of it just I don't know, kind of soured it for you. Yeah, it did. It did. I don't. Uh, I, I I'm definitely not enjoying it as much. Yeah, it, it's just one of those guilty by association type deals, you know. And it's like, yeah, you know, this was supposed to be fun. I I like I love creating those covers for people, but you know, I don't know. You think you'll what, still do your own covers though yeah. going forward? Oh yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. Um, Is that what got you doing other covers for people? You just started doing yours first and, and realized they're pretty awesome. Yeah, and yeah it was. I actually just was stone broke at the time, and I I mm -hmm. did know immediately the value of if you're going to put your books on digital, and this was new to me as well, the whole digital thing. That I think I had about ten books at the time. If I'm going to do that, I can't hire somebody to do really, really great covers right. for all of yeah. them. So I basically just over the course of a year gave myself a crack, crash course in uh, Photoshop and other design manipulation tools and did the best I could, you know. Mm -hmm. But they got better and better as anything will with practice. And people started asking me, who does your covers? And I said, well, I do. And they're like, well, well do mine. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And that was, I think that was about, geez, maybe 12 years ago now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I do love it, but, you know, I don't... I don't know. The spark is kind of gone for me. Yeah. So is, is Photoshop the main program you use for them? Yeah. Yeah. It's just something that I started with and kind of find it works well with my own yeah. design instincts, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm constantly being told, hey, you should do this or you should use that. You should use this. And absolutely. And I could probably be way better at it if I did. But I don't know. I kind of tend to stick with what I'm comfortable with. have your own with. style for it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I kind of, you know, it's intuitive enough for me that I know I know my way around and yeah. Yeah, because I, I took computer graphic design a bit in college. So I've got Photoshop 
and people have all these shortcuts and stuff and i just do it my own way and that's how i do it it seems like you kind of do it the same way just your own yeah. way and figure it out your own way and all that kind of stuff and it's probably harder you know i probably make it a lot <laughs> probably, more my, probably yeah but whatever i i create of it and my photoshop's ancient i've got like cs2 which is like probably 20 years old <laughs> I mean, I, I keep trying I don't to even use know Photoshop, but then my computer keeps saying, you don't have it, so stop trying. And I just <laughs> go on, so. Mine just says Photoshop 2022, so I assume. So yeah, yours is new. Mine's literally yeah. like 20 years old, my version. <laughs> Did I send you? I, I got, I I got mean, the updated free one. Did I send that to you? No. Uh, that's what, I, like, all the paper cuts, advertisements, and all the yeah. thumbnails I do for YouTube, i done on that 20-year-old Photoshop. It still works, so it it's it, it works fine I there's much difference to be honest with you every time they update it i'm like okay well what's different i don't know what's different <laughs> they move something i don't know yeah they move the buttons the, the toolbars on the left instead of the front and you know just get yeah. another 300 bucks out of somebody i don't know yeah. so like if if someone wants you to do a cover would you rather them tell you i like this aspect and this aspect or does anybody ever come to you with the blank slate and say just do whatever you want to yeah, both happen. Yeah. I'll sometimes get very detailed um, designs where the person knows exactly what they want, right mm -hmm. down to the color of it. Okay. And other times I'll have somebody just say, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I have a clue, uh, but I like your work, so do whatever. Do whatever. And I'll just ask them a couple of questions uh, like, well, what's, what's a prominent feature of the book? What's the bad guy like? You know, where's yeah. it set? And they'll tell me. And from that, I'll, I'll try and, you know, just really make the most striking image based on those components. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. Is there a way you prefer? Do you prefer them to tell you a little bit? Or do you prefer sort of the blank slate? Well, the risk with the blank slate is that it may not end up being relevant to the book. You yeah. know, the, <laughs> the less they tell you going in, the more they can complain later that is wrong about the cover. Yeah. Sort of like the... Uh, the Jack Ketchum girl next door cover, the skeleton yeah. cheerleader on there, which I think you mentioned in House on Abigail Lane at one yeah. point. Yeah. I I've did. not seen that cover. I, I have the old. It's it's a trade. skeleton. It looks like an old Goosebumps cover. I, I've heard There's about a skeleton it. Skeleton yes. with a cheerleader, yeah. and it's like the most misleading cover you can ever see on a book. <laughs> yeah. It's. Yeah. And I try to avoid that. But, you know, there's a fine line too between. I like when people give me a bit of freedom. Mm hmm. So they come in here and say, well, look, this is kind of what I had in mind, but you do your own thing. That's yeah. perfect. Because yeah. at least I have guidance. I know what the characters look like. If they want characters on, I know what the what the you know style they want is. But letting me play around with it, those are usually the best covers I do. Mm -hmm. Because I do you ever get go ahead, sorry. Oh, because I just get to it's kind of a, a great combination between their guidance and and me just kind of letting loose and seeing how it all turns out. But um, yeah, some of my favorites have been have been ones where it was a bit of both. With all the covers you've done, have you ever gotten inspired by this piece of art you've done to like, oh, maybe I could make a story off this? Not that you're plagiarizing their story, but something you've done on the cover that maybe sparks a story for you. Um, I would say probably every second cover that I delivered to people, <laughs> I wish I had kept from myself. Oh yeah, I just actually said that I designed that one for um, Kevin Lucia. Um, okay and, i think uh, it's got like the skull or the face on it right face the kind of stretchy face on it yeah i did that one and delivered it and he said wow i love it thanks very much and i, and I actually wrote back to him and i said this is goes into the category of ones i wish i'd kept for myself <laughs> and if i don't have a story i will write one to go with it because i want to use this cover that's happened a bunch i've been sitting here just tooling around at me and i came up with a lovely cover and i thought oh yeah i'm gonna write something for this yeah, and it's two days later, someone writes me, "Go, do you have anything with a pumpkin on it?" And I'm looking at the <laughs> design, with it, and I'm going, "Damn it!" Do they ever give back to you after you say that? Do you just do they say, "No, you take it," <laughs> or do they keep it for themselves? <laughs> oh, they're just it's it's out of my hands at that point. <laughs> I, I'm I'm outvoted. So, so do you do that fairly often, where you just create a cover just to have sort of a backlog? Not as much anymore. Um, uh -huh. This year, I haven't at all. And mm -hmm. probably won't. But um, I used to, yeah. I used to just as kind of just like practicing and, you know, honing the skills. I was once a week maybe throw together something myself to try out new styles and 
tools and stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, yeah, that's one of those things I have kind of retired from. You said you use your own photography some and some of them as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun because if somebody says, well, what I want is a particular thing and I cannot find appropriate art anywhere online, I'll go and engineer the scene myself. Uh -huh. Like an absolute friggin' goof, I'll be in the bedroom. <laughs> Angling the lights so something looks more prominent than the other thing. But I love doing that. That's that's a lot of fun as well. But yeah, I my hand has appeared on so many book covers I've done. <laughs> that's awesome. Yep. Yeah. So as we start to uh, wind things down here, because I mean, we want you to get to bed, obviously. Uh, What's bed? I don't even know anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, so you have a website people could go to to yep. uh, for these covers, for some of these pre made covers and, and mm -hmm. uh, contact you. What, what's the website? It's elderlemondesign.net. Okay. Used to be .com, but it got hacked by a porn site. So now it's .net. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have laughed at that, but that's kind of funny. Well, you can because I logged in one morning, elderlemondesign.com, and it was a bunch of <laughs> adventurers doing their adventuring, <laughs> spelunking. It, it, that's separate from your uh, what, from your regular website. Your, what do you have? It's just Keelan Keelan Patrick Burke. Burke. Com. Okay. Yep, that's my name, yeah. So you and need to go ahead and purchase Keelan Patrick Burke. Francis.com. We should, so yeah. That domain, too. Yeah. It's, it's, I'll, I'll sell it to you. Fans. Yeah. But, and uh, for, yeah. Uh, for the stalkers, they could they could check you out on, on Twitter. You're on Instagram, too, right? I think. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, and I'm on TikTok and Facebook. I'm oh, yeah. everywhere. Definitely, definitely TikTok. Yeah. Definitely TikTok. TikTok's fun. It's entertaining. Definitely. It is. I, wanna, I, I didn't want to start a TikTok. I didn't want to start a TikTok, number one. Two. Yeah. <laughs> When I did, I just was determined to not make it be buy my book, read my book, buy yeah. my book. So yeah. I just was sitting here one day and said, What the fucking fucking feck? <laughs> and then I went, Do you know what feck means? <laughs> because Jay, do you know what that means? If I, if one of those accidentally come out while I'm in the in the middle of doing a book video, I'll have to explain it anyway. So why don't I not just make it about whatever you hear in Irish when I say go feck yourself is what he means. <laughs> Oh, oh Chad's here now. So. Yeah. Let's wait. Start all over. We'll start at the beginning. Only an hour and a half into it, we're going to start over. He's yeah. he's probably doing his own show tonight. That's why he didn't come. Yeah. I mean, why are you even here, Chad? You got. <laughs> you just want to hear me say the same answers all over again? They're not going to be any more interesting than they were on your show. So he just loves to listen to your voice, like I do. <laughs> well, feeling that's what we do. We we let Chad interview people first, and then we take all the questions and just. Yeah, sure we just literally simple. just plagiarize his entire script. Exactly. With a little dub over. That's all. Yes, yes, I did want names. Yeah. yeah. I did want to ask you though, because you post a lot of like uh you make like uh pastries and cakes and all that kind of stuff. Do you enjoy baking? Oh because everything you make looks absolutely delicious. In another life, I'm a baker. In another right. life, you throw all this malarkey, this bullshit dealing with <laughs> this crap out the window. And I just have a really, really decked out kitchen and I make feckin' fucking cakes <laughs> that's it because you know what <clears throat> yeah just <laughs> leave me alone let me make desserts and piss that's off. how you get published you send your book along with the cake you, know? you need to make a keelan patrick burke cookbook with all your cakes and pastries and stuff in there but i'm thinking of because... the way the way that things are going with people particularly certain people online it's gonna end up being a keelan patrick kin cookbook <laughs> there you go. flesh recipes for the feast folk and Chad's a cannibal, so he'll he'll be all about that. Chad is a cannibal. Is he? I didn't know that. He did. Yeah. The the cannibal creator, that's an autobiography. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I didn't want to say anything because I hate I'm not gonna jump on this bandwagon of inferring that the author has anything to do with the characters they're writing there about. There you go. I did <laughs> that one though, yeah. Oh no, I did I did a whole video about it. It's proven fact. I had research and everything that he's a cannibal. <laughs> so it was like a news. I know that Chad absolutely hated that video. <laughs> <laughs> he was just like, okay, thanks. Yeah. He's not sitting there going, why did I log in? Why? Wow. He's gone now. He left as soon as he came in. <laughs> yeah. He was like, look at flies. Flies. <laughs> yeah. So do you cook any other stuff or you mainly just like to bake? I, I love to cook. I love to I, I don't bake, but I love to cook. Everything. About six years ago now, I'd say. 
I mm -hmm. I was the kind of guy who would just throw a frozen thing into the into the stove and that would be it you know store yeah. boss frozen pizzas whatever it that was it couldn't do much else i could mash potatoes because naturally i'm a walking cliche but, <laughs> but that so was is, about it banger, it. is it bangers and mash in ireland too or is that just england 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 okay well uh i got tired of it when i started to teach myself to cook and now there's very little i can't make mm -hmm. i just love it if it's complicated as fuck give it to me I, I, yeah. I love that. Doesn't mean I'll always be able to do it, but I love, I love it. I love cooking mm -hmm. all kinds of dishes. It doesn't matter what it is. I just absolutely adore being in the kitchen. It's one of the few times where I feel like, I guess like writing, it's, it's where you feel like you have absolute control. Yeah. Because outside of life, you definitely don't. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I like it. I like to experiment as well. Like, for example, one of my favorite dishes is a chicken curry. Mm -hmm. And I used to love that in Ireland when we went to Indian restaurants. But I have not been able to find anything that was exactly like it over here. So I decided to make it. And I was in there like the friggin' Swedish chef with my <laughs> trying to get that thing to work, you know. But eventually I did. And it's, it's now that my favorite thing I make. It's just it's absolute, for me, perfection. That's kind of how I love to, or I started to cook. Like what I wanted wasn't around here anywhere because I'm in the middle of Kentucky and I don't have all this Oriental and Thai food and that stuff. So it's like, I'm just going to make it myself. Yeah. Baby steps and I just turn into, I love, like my wife doesn't cook at all. I'm the cook, but I like to do it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It's, it's, if I ever retire from this ball game, I'm definitely going <laughs> to, I'm definitely going into the kitchen and that's it. Let somebody else serve the food. I just want to be hidden in the kitchen away from people. Yeah. Like I'm telling you, you should do a cookbook. That'd be all horror themed, like cakes and stuff like that. That'd be awesome. I say open yeah. a restaurant. Or just open I'd, a restaurant. Yeah. That would, I would take love, a I would love to have a food truck. A food truck would be dope to have. I would absolutely love that. Mm -hmm. I, would love, I would love a food truck and just travel the country in it. That'd be great. You, you could sell your books out the back of it too. Oh, you know. Two sandwiches and, and a side of a book. Yeah, there you go. It. Yeah, but knowing the way I manage finances, I'd probably have to sell the books to buy the ingredients for the food. <laughs> it's just a vicious circle; just keep, <laughs> keeps going around. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, Keelan, we're very happy you decided to join us and help us kick off uh, season four of Paper Cuts. We totally appreciate you stopping by <laughs> on what hour and a half of sleep. Um, <laughs> Speeding through most of the states just to get here, just to do this. Totally appreciate it. So, look, you got the pay chat now. Burks Bakes and other sour candy. That's <laughs> no, copyright I'm, that right now. No, no, because this this strikes like it strikes me as a future legal battle waiting to happen. So <laughs> but change some of the letters. There you go. Yeah, you turn the S to a dollar sign, and you know. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> to uh, to to recap, we we, we learned uh, his full name. This evening, there you go. It's a secret. <laughs> you got you got to watch from the beginning. We're I don't tell you anymore. Maybe that that could be like a a trivia question for like a later show for us, <laughs> right? See who yeah. actually see who pays attention. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But we're gonna let you uh go do what you do on a Friday night. It is Friday night still, right? Yeah. Yeah. He probably doesn't know. He's he's been awake for like three weeks is traveling. It, so what year is it? But look for uh, was it Cotton know. Mouth? Is Cotton Mouth yeah. coming out sometime soon? Can't really Hopefully. tell. But it's in the process, yeah. Yeah. There's a bunch of it's stuff coming, but I unfortunately, which is not much good for you guys, but there's a lot <laughs> of things coming that I can't talk about. That's good. Just be excited. More Burke, more Keelan Patrick Burke's coming. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it on a cliffhanger. There's a lot of stuff. We just can't talk about it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and none of it's even as remotely as exciting as it sounds, so that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> you got to sign up for the OnlyFans, and then you'll get all the details. After yeah, dark. Right. What is it? Yeah. It's just called Lonely Fans, because I well, block it. So it's me talking to myself. <laughs> That's all we're doing. We're just talking to each other right now. These people are not even here watching. So it's actually just me commenting on my all my different accounts. It's just me. Yeah, it's, it's like he'll, he'll he'll post something with the paper cuts account on Twitter, and then I'll respond <laughs> to it. And I swear people think we're talking. I'm talking to myself. It's and I'll, I don't... I'll I'll put something with the paper cut account on there, and then he'll respond. And they think we're just I don't know, but we're I not going to correct. Respond there to book blather. How are you, Dave? 
Dave, yeah, hi, how are you? That's a that's a lovely comment and great to hear. I really appreciate. It. I appreciate your videos too, by the way. Dave's a good guy. I can't I can't remember what his dog's name is, but his dog's always in his videos. Oh, his dog Olive. Is. Olive, that's Olive. right. Yes, yeah. dog is adorable. Dave. I love that. Like you know, unlike a prop dog, the dog actually just seems to be totally into what's happening. Yeah. My like, dogs, I've got two. They would just they would just cause right. a fucking mess. <laughs> the camera comes on two seconds after they've had an actual conversation about the book that he's about to talk. <laughs> about. Yeah. But, I love it. We need a we need just straight up reviews from Olive. Like if she puts her paw on it, she loved it. If she walks away, she didn't like it or something like that. Yeah, I'd be worried though because Dave, <laughs> light, you know, he'll, he'll... That's, that's probably his next video for tomorrow. That's he'll probably release that probably all these all of picks or something like that. So. Look, now she's gonna get big headed. <laughs> yeah, she deserves. All right, it. let's get out of here. We're done. Let's get out of here. All right, no Keila's gonna fall asleep. Again, thanks so much for stopping by. Season four no is underway. We uh, we have uh, some exciting episodes coming up for you guys. So thanks for everyone in the chat. And, of course, our, our guest for this evening, Keelan Patrick Burke. I'm not going to say his other name in there. That's for a <laughs> trivia question later on. Uh, for Brad, that's over there. I'm Jay. Thanks, everyone, for stopping by. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate Glad it. Glad you guys me. Yay. It's good to talk to you, man. Appreciate it. You too. You too. Love, love you, Jay. I know you do. I know you do.